Good morning. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, uh, I'm going to um, give a uh, this, this headset. I hope it doesn't make me look too crazy. It feels crazy. Uh, um, try to give a little overview of um, Hadoop and a little history, and in the process, um, extract some themes that, that I see that, that, are, that are involved in the software, um, and uh, hopefully entertain you and tell you at least a couple things that you, you hadn't heard before. Um, but I'm hoping to sort of introduce everyone to the, the um, general areas that will be discussed at the conference in the next couple of days. Um, so there's an opportunity here um, that's arrived in the last 10 years or so, um, it's been arriving for a long time, uh, where hardware has gotten much, much cheaper and much, much faster. Um, uh, data has consequently started to accumulate much faster. People can afford to um, collect a lot of data and save it. Um, and um, these trends have, have outrun um, a lot of database technology. If you, you, you can collect so much data that it's very difficult to build a database over all of it and process all of it um, using that database, using conventional database technologies. Um, uh, it, and, and so there's an opportunity here to, to devise some new software stack um, that, that addresses this. Um, but it's not totally trivial. Uh, you can't just you know, run a database on every, uh, on every, every machine and, and have everything work automatically. Um, one of the problems, um, one of the, 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 the things that makes it hard is that scaling reliably is hard. And in fact, doing anything distributed reliably is surprisingly hard. Uh, it's, it's, everything takes, anybody who's done this realizes that everything takes much longer to debug uh, when it's distributed and you need it to be long running um, and you've got lots and lots of machines that it's, it's running on. Um, uh, as a um, uh, you know, little, little thought experiment, if you've got thousands of machines, which a lot of people do, um, uh, you've got one of them is going to fail every day just about, even if they've, any, any given box may only fail once a year or so, uh, but when you've got that many, the chances are that you're going to have failures every day. Um, and so something's always going to be broken um, and, and or breaking. Uh, and you need to be able to handle these things gracefully. Um, you need to not lose data. You need to have a, a fault-tolerant store. Um, and you need to be able to um, not stop running your computations just because uh, 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 something has failed. Um, computations need to proceed um, and hopefully not even get slowed down too much. Um, uh, some computations, even on thousands of nodes, can take days to run. Um, and it's especially important that those complete, because you've got a lot invested in them by the, by the time they've been running for a couple days. Uh, so, so this is a, a pretty critical problem. Um, so another problem that uh, makes things a little tricky uh, is the bandwidth to the data. Um, you see a lot of um, enterprise setups use um, uh, SANs. They have you know, special boxes where they do all their storage and other boxes where they do all their computing. Uh, and that oftentimes chokes as you try to uh, add more and more processors. Um, uh, you, you need to have a lot of bandwidth to get at the data if you're going to process it in a reasonable amount of time. Um, uh, so what, what tends to be the, the fastest thing to do is to um, read off local drives. And again, a little, little thought experiment. Um, if you've got um, a thousand node cluster uh, and you're reading these over the, over the network, um, uh, if you've got, say, 100 megabytes per second, um, from any node to any other node, which is not, not unreasonable to, to assume, um, then you're gonna, it's going to take you, um, uh, to scan 100 terabytes, it take you 165 minutes, which is a long time. Uh, and if you instead were able to read all the data from local drives of those machines, you'd be, you'd be down to eight minutes. Um, so uh, if you can possibly arrange things so that the computation uh, happens where the data lives already, uh, then things will go much faster. That's, that's all this is trying to say. Uh, and, and, but that's a, not an, an, an obviously easy thing to do. Um, so uh, enter Hadoop. Um, uh, so first I'm going to give a little um, high-level overview of the, the properties that 
Hadoop uh, has, and then uh, tell the story of sort of, of how, it, how it got there. Um, it had a system that um, scales to thousands of computers. Um, uh, it can effectively use all of the CPUs and all of the disks simultaneously, um, uh, the processing data, um, streaming, streaming data off all the drives through, through the CPUs and, and doing useful work, hopefully. Um, it's, a, it's a new software stack um, uh, built on, on new foundations, which I'm going to take some time to go through. Um, and it's um, actually getting pretty well established. Uh, it's about um, five years old now, uh, arguably depending on, on how you count. Um, uh, and most of the big websites that you know of are using it. Um, the big exception is, is Google, which has their, their own technology, which is very similar. Um, and lots and lots of companies are starting to use it as well uh, for, uh, for replacing traditional or, or augmenting traditional enterprise technologies. So what, what's changed here? Um, I've come up with five things. You guys can probably come up with others, but I'm going I'm to try to hit on these five themes as I, as I go through um, how we got here. Um, uh, first one is commodity hardware uh, has been a, a, a big uh, enabler here um, and being able to take advantage of that. <clears throat> Another theme. Uh, sequential file access uh, rather than random file access. Um, sharding of both data and computation, uh, splitting things out um, and, and using, using sharding as a means to distribute. Um, automating reliability, another really important theme. Um, uh, and lastly, um, using open source. Uh, I, traditionally, enterprise technologies have not been open source uh, and um, most of the things I'm going to talk about today are open source technologies. So that's, that's been a big, big change, I think, in this, in this wave. Uh, so I'm going to go through these uh, various things. Um, is it cropped there? A little it is. Uh, so commodity hardware. <clears throat> what do I mean by this? Uh, it doesn't mean necessarily that you go down and, and buy them at the local store, um, but rather that the components, the, the basic hardware components, um, are things that are mass produced. Um, uh, they're not exotic things that are only produced for this particular use. Um, so the, the CPUs, the memory, the drives um, uh, are, are built from standard, uh, you know, standard PC components. Um, and that gets you on this price performance curve that we want, we want to be on. Uh, that, that's, that makes it all, all happen and make, make, makes us be able to ride uh, the, these, these economies. Um, Typically, we arrange the hardware in a two-level uh, hierarchy. Um, you've got uh, racks. Uh, everything within a rack is on a switch, typically. Um, has relatively high bandwidth, um, uh, say, gigabit Ethernet um, between each node on the rack. Um, uh, but then you've got multiple racks, if you've got a lot of machines, as, as folks tend to. Um, and between the racks, you've got maybe a few gigabits um, but you don't have a gigabit between every node in every rack, uh, if that makes sense. Um, usually we see 20, 40, something like that, nodes per rack and per switch. Uh, obviously varies. Um, uh, but it, it's a, it scales a long ways linearly. You can, you can um, keep adding racks um, until you get up to uh, you know, 2,000, 10,000 nodes which is as much as most people can, can afford. Um, uh, eventually, the software s starts to have some issues, but most people don't, don't get to that point. Um, uh, and you get pretty much linear scalability. Um, ah, I, now I, I couldn't read what, I couldn't figure out what I said on that last thing. It says, at commodity prices. Um, all right, so how did, how did I get here? Uh, what's the, the path that, that led to me being involved with these kinds of technologies? Um, I started in the 80s um, doing full text indexing, um, uh, first doing, uh, as doing research uh, in full text and then building various um, production full text uh, search and retrieval systems. Um, uh, I first started implementing them using a B-tree, uh, seemed like the, the thing to do. Um, a B-tree is a foundation of most relational databases, so how many people you know, ended up setting B-trees in there? CS courses. 
a smattering. Ah, okay. Um, <clears throat> a B tree uh, is based, the, the, the way you measure B tree performance is in random accesses, uh, and so it's a, it's a log n accesses um, uh, per access, per update. Um, uh, the um, base of the log tends to be uh, fairly big, so you, um, you generally only have to do you know, one or two disk accesses. Um, per database access in a, in a B tree, but you're still doing some. Uh, and seeks are, um, I've, I've come to believe, evil. <laughs> um, uh, over, over time, over the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, maybe 30 years, um, uh, as things have gotten faster, seek time is one of the things that's uh, decreased the least. Um, uh, it, it's, it's really lagged. Um, uh, compared to the disk size and the, and the ability to transfer the data. Um, and uh, so anything that's based on, on doing seeks is, gonna, is hurting um, uh, relative to everything else in, in the technology stack. Uh, so that's, that's one reason it's a, it's a problem. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, uh, so, but anyway, the, the, what, what I quickly learned uh, in the... Um, uh, I guess probably the early 90s, um, uh, was that um, instead of using B-trees, uh, you could build indexes and then merge them in, in doing batch processing, where you kept data streaming off of the disk. Uh, and these batched merge computations um, were a much faster way uh, to build uh, full text indexes. Um, and uh, just you know, orders of magnitude, and it kept scaling. Um, and and it, was, it was practical to build indexes for um, uh, you know, tens of millions of documents uh, up to hundreds of millions. Um, so first, a little bit more about a B tree. Um, I guess I already said most of this. Um, so if you're if you're if you were to do a B tree update for every word in a, that you see in the, in the text, um, then it's going to be n log n seeks, um, uh, which you know seek time even on a modern drive is five milliseconds, and if you look at the number of words in documents, that it's it's going to be slow. Um, a uh, little bit on um, seek time versus transfer time. Uh, transfer time is, generally speaking, useful. I mean, unless you're reading data that you don't care about, which sometimes you end up doing. Um, uh, but generally, you're actually able to process the data that you, that you read when, you, when you're transferring. Seek time, you're just waiting. Um, you're really getting no useful work done, unless you've got another thread or something. Uh, and, and so it's, if you can f come up with algorithms that eliminate the seeks, um, in general, you're going to be better off. It's just, it's just there's, there's not a whole lot of, of good to, to doing seeks. Uh, it's just sort of a principle. Um, and, uh, and, so, and I think we're seeing more and more as a theme in, in all the technologies we're going to talk about here, people aren't doing random access. Um, I think a lot of people have hoped that SSDs would change that. Um, but there's still a penalty to doing a random access on SSE. It's considerably less, um, but it's still not as cheap as, it's still not as fast as doing sequential access. Uh, so I, th I think this is gonna, gonna remain uh, a strategy for, for performance. Um, so back to our storyline. Um, in 2000, uh, I had uh, written this open source full text engine. I'd written a full text engine in, the, in 97 or 98 uh, I made it open source in 2000, called it Lucene. Um, uh, and the way it works is more or less, as I, as I described a few minutes ago, um, by sorting batches of updates and, uh, and then merging the sorted updates with the existing data um, and to basically eliminate seeks while building indexes. Um, and you know, I, I had done both. I built full text indexes using a B tree and tried lots of optimizations on them. Uh, and then did it this other way with Lucene, uh, and it was, you know, night and day in terms of performance. Um, so that was a, the first foray of, uh, for me into something that was really uh, organized around this principle of, of not, using, not doing any random access if you could avoid it. Um, but also um, beginnings of working on open source for me. Um, so when I talk about open source, I tend to mean Apache-style open source. Um, uh, and not just the Apache style licensing, um, but more the, um, the community style uh, development of having uh, diverse, collaborative, uh, merit-based communities 
that are developing software together. Um, uh, and my experience, uh, you know, I, the reason I think that open source is, has been a, a good thing, um, uh, personally, um, I like it because uh, when you write open source and you change jobs, which people in our industry often do, you don't lose contact with your, with your code. And I worked for a lot of companies um, before I started doing open source software, and all the code I wrote at those companies I can, can no longer read, I can no longer refer to, and it's just a pain. I want to go back and say, well, how did I do that this time? And how did this other guy who I worked with do things? And, and I can't look at that. Um, and so it gives you this, this continuity. Um, even deeper level of continuity, um, uh, I worked for um, one company that went bankrupt, and there were, you know, I don't know 100 engineers, wrote a lot of, a lot of great software, um, and the software's gone, effectively. I, I have no idea where it disappeared into, but it's some intellectual property black hole that, that sucked that software away. And uh, no one will ever legally see that software again. And you don't see that happen with open source. Open source, you write it, even if it's not good, it's still out there, people can refer to it. Um, and, and I think that's a, a nice property. Um, uh, another thing that I like about it is um, you don't have to try to sell it. Um, uh, some people do, but, but uh, I, I think it's, you, you can afford to be very honest. You can say it does this, and if you want to do that, then you can use it. If it's not quite what you want, you can try to fix it. And if it's not what you want at all, well, don't use it. You didn't pay us anything. We're not trying to get you to pay us anything. Uh, it is what it is. And, and you can be very honest. Um, oh yeah, it has that bug. And I'm not interested in fixing it right now because I'm working on something else. But if you want to fix it, you can. So you can, you can be very honest. You don't have to pander. Um, in, in, in commercial software, one often has to try to convince people that software does things that it doesn't do, maybe not yet, that you hope it will do, uh, convince them that it's bug-free. You have to you get into all these games, which uh, aren't, to my thinking, fun games. Um, I, I'd much rather be very honest with people and, and try to engage them to, to work with me uh, and, and tell them uh, you know, honestly where the shortcomings are and, uh, and what advantages are and, and so on. Um, users also seem to love open source. Uh, in my experience, the seen, things I've worked on have had tremendous rates of adoption. Uh, one obvious thing is that the, 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 the price is right, it's, it's free, uh, and people like that. But I think there's, there's something more to that. I think if you just gave away free software without the source code and without the processes, people wouldn't adopt it as readily. Um, uh, I think people, uh, developers really appreciate the transparency that they can um, they can download the code, they can try to build something. So first, it's free, that's, so there's no, no obstacle to that. Um, but then when they have a problem, they can look at the source um, without you know, much difficulty, and they can patch it. Um, and people do this all the time uh, when, when, they, when they're using open source software. They, they go beneath the, um, the, the, the surface, of it, beneath the documentation, and look a little bit at the implementation um, and say, oh, and they realize that maybe they had a misconception about how it worked, um, and they can, they can uh, better, better resolve their own problems. Or they can go to a, a, um, a mailing list and get some help. Um, and uh, people seem very comfortable working with this um, and uh, a adopting software in, in this model. Um, uh, and they're also not worried about it getting pulled away from them and having to uh, pay money for it later. Anyway, it it's, seems to be uh, something that people pick up readily. Developers um, uh, can just start doing it on their own without a lot of approval, without signing a lot of contracts. Um, companies like using open source, uh, in my experience, um, uh, for several reasons. One thing is I think it actually produces better code. Um, that people, when they're writing code that they know uh, is going to be seen in public um, by people outside of the, the company they work in, um, uh, they're a little more careful um, to make sure that it it's, you know, uh, looks good, that it's, they've thought of uh, various situations that, that might work or not work. Um, and also, if you've got different companies using software for slightly different purposes, um, then when they collaborate, they need to generalize more, and they need to take a little more time to not do quick one-off hacks. Um, you, you can't get away with that generally in open source projects. You, you, you have to 
um, because you're collaborating with, with lots of people, um, you need to find the common general solution, um, uh, which generally produces better software as well, I'd argue. Um, people also love to work on it um, uh, because they get uh, respect from a much wider peer of pools. Um, instead of the you know, four or five engineers on their team being aware of what they're doing, there can be hundreds of people um, out on the internet who, are, who they're working with um, and who they'll keep working with uh, for the rest of their career. Um, uh, and this drives people to produce um, uh, more and better things. Um, and finally, the, another you know, sort of obvious one, um, uh, that the costs are shared. Um, that not just the costs of um, uh, producing the software, but the costs of testing it, the cost of documenting it. Um, uh, all these costs are, are shared. Um, and without any um, you know, middleman trying to uh, extract a profit out of it, um, everybody just sort of pitches in and, and writes a little documentation, does a little testing, uh, and, and together it, it usually gets done. Um, so I, I'm happy to answer more questions later. These are just a few uh, semi-random thoughts about, about open source. Um, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Um, so, moving on to Nutch, um, uh, another project uh, started in around 2002. Um, for those who aren't familiar with it, it's, it's, a, um, it's a pretty ambitious effort to um, write a web search engine in, in the style of, of Google or, uh, I mean, at the time, uh, Yahoo, um, uh, now Bing, um, that indexes the whole web. Um, uh, and do, but do it entirely as open source. Um, uh, I thought this would be a, a good thing to have. Um, it's, it's a big project. You know, these, the companies that run these things have hundreds if not thousands of people involved in, in maintaining them. Uh, they're, they're not simple uh, to do both at the scale and at the level of quality that, that people expect. Um, but anyway, back to the, uh, the, the data requirements. Um, as you're crawling, uh, you need to know uh, you need to know which pages to crawl, um, and so if you see a link on a page that you've you've pulled down, you need to decide whether you've seen that link already. And so you've got to have a database of every link you've ever seen, um, and uh, you've got to be looking up in it at roughly the rate that you're able to download pages, um, which is pretty fast. Bandwidth is pretty cheap. Um, you can pull down a lot of pages um, uh, per second. Um, and uh, if you're trying to crawl, I think at the time we were starting that, we were, we were you know, thinking the entire internet was a billion pages. Now these days, it's, you know, people are, are saying much larger numbers. Um, but uh, in order to do a billion pages, um, uh, you have to do better than you know, 10K database accesses uh, per second um, uh, on a pretty large database, um, a, billion, uh, a billion pages. Um, and if you do the math, it doesn't really work out to do this with a, with a database doing seeks. Um, uh, probably it's going to get big enough that you're not going to fit the entire database in memory. Um, uh, and maybe you could, but you don't want to necessarily assume that. So this um, sort of search, sort merge application, er, optimization seemed applicable. Um, and moreover, Lucene was pretty much a single box solution. In this case, um, you're going to need a distributed solution to really, to really handle this. Um, uh, so we came up with a simple distributed solution. Um, uh, shard by URLs uh, have, have, have different, um, uh, different boxes um, that, are, that are working on different uh, space, sections of the URL space um, and do everything with batches uh, and you copy files around and you sort them, you, you, know, you, you, sort them, you, you uh, break them up into the shards, you distribute the shards to the nodes that handle those shards um, it was a lot of manual processing. You can sort of imagine the kind of, kind of algorithm that, that was used here. Um, uh, it was not automated. It was a, it was a real pain to operate. Um, but it was a scalable algorithm for doing uh, a, distri a distributed database at, at this kind of scale. Um, uh, then in uh, 2004, when we were in the middle of this and pulling our hair out trying to actually run these things on, on five node clusters, um, uh, Google published its GFS and MapReduce papers. Um, uh, and, you know, it was a, it was a, a great, uh, you know, it was a light that went on. Um, 
it obviously, it, it did almost exactly the same steps that we were doing manually, um, but automated them uh, in, in a way. Um, and also was a general platform so that if you wanted to change the algorithm and do other kinds of databases that were related, um, you could use the same library again and again. You didn't have to uh, rebuild all the automation um, for each algorithm. Um, so it um, looked like a, a great thing, uh, and we went about re-implementing this in, in Nutch. Um, and it took us a year or so to get that going. Um, uh, and in 2005, uh, Yahoo became very interested um, in uh, using this, this type of a platform. Yahoo had its own um, in-house distributed solutions, which were very difficult to manage um, uh, and uh, weren't, weren't scaling as well as they liked. Uh, and they, they saw the papers about MapReduce and GFS and thought that they would like to have a system like that. And they saw that, the, um, that Nutch appeared to have the most mature at the time starting point um, uh, for building this. Uh, and so they, um, they said, we want to join. We've got a lot of engineers. We want to, we want to work on this. Uh, so I went to work for Yahoo in the uh, beginning of 2006. And we took the HGFS and MapReduce parts out of Nutch and started a new project called Hadoop. Um, uh, so Hadoop has two primary components, uh, HGFS, the Hadoop Distributed File System, um, and uh, MapReduce. I'm going to go over real quick what those are for those who haven't been through this a hundred times. Um, uh, HGFS is pretty simple. Um, the, the complications all come from just the fact that it has to be distributed and reliable, um, but it's actually easy to describe what it does. Um, uh, there's two kinds of nodes in the system. Uh, there's, there's the name node, um, uh, which is, uh, there's generally one name node. Um, and the name node maintains two tables in memory, uh, a listing of, uh, a mapping from file name to a list of block IDs, um, and then another table um, uh, from block ID to a list of data nodes that have that block, have the data for that block. Um, so, um, uh, a data node then just has a, effectively a single uh, map, um, which is from a block ID to a bunch of bytes that are the, the content of that block. Um, so we'll walk through a couple of scenarios. Um, to open a file, you talk to the name node, you say, um, I've got this file name, um, and it comes back and says, OK, you want the following block IDs at the following data nodes. It dereferences both of those both of its maps and gives you a list of data nodes to contact and um, a list of block IDs to ask them for in sequence. Um, the first block contains the first part of the file, the second, the second part, and so on. Um, and then the client picks a, a data node and talks directly to it to get the data. So no data flows through the name node. Um, all, the, all the data just goes directly between the client and the, and the uh, data node. Um, uh, and similarly for writing data. Um, uh, you, you talk to the name node, you say, where, where, where's the data node that I should write some data to? Um, and it says, here's a block ID, go to this uh, data node and start writing. Um, uh, so fairly simple. It scales well. Um, uh, the files are sharded across commodity hardware. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's meeting these goals that, that we, that we needed, needed to meet. Um, uh, it's efficient, inexpensive. Um, uh, the reliability is, is automated. You generally, generally replicate every block on three data nodes. Um, uh, the data nodes regularly report into the name node uh, saying what blocks they have. And so the name node can then decide this block is under replicated or uh, I haven't heard from this data node in a while and issue commands to the data nodes to replicate things um, or reduce replication um, to rebalance if, if some nodes have more data than they ought to. Um, uh, and um, uh, the name node is somewhat of a single point of failure, but you can have a hot spare for that, and that's, there, there's a lot of work going on these days to Im improve that situation. Um, MapReduce, uh, simple programming model, pretty much uh, captures what I was uh, sort of pointing to in the, in the Nutch case um, of uh, running something distributed on a bunch of shards, um, then uh, refragmenting those, those shard, the output uh, and sending that to um, uh, across all the nodes. So you, 
you generally, um, my mouse show up here? No, it doesn't. Um, looks like it should point, but yeah, there we go. Um, uh, so if you've, you've got your input data, um, uh, you break it up into um, blocks, shards, some sort of chunks, which then you can process in a distributed manner uh, um, and uh, what's called the map stage. So the map stage just gets the data and does some processing on it and produces some output. Um, then uh, that output um, is, uh, is itself sharded um, based on typically some different attribute. Um, uh, so if, for example, if you consider the, um, in the crawl, web crawl case, a um, uh, very, very simple-minded way to, to do this would be the mapper could actually fetch the web pages um, so it gets uh, just a URL in and then uh, output a um, set of URLs that were on each page um, and then you send all the URLs that were into a, in a given shard to a single reduce node um, and so every, every mapper would send output to a different reducer uh, and, uh, and then you write the outputs as a, as a couple of chunks. Um, so it's a fairly simple pattern. Um, uh, turns out to be useful for lots of lots of different classes of problems. Uh, it's not not perfect for everything, um, but uh, once you've got it implemented reliably, uh, it's a it's a great hammer to hit lots of problems with. Um, uh, so some observations about it: um, the um, computation is run on the same nodes as the storage. So you you um, all the uh, input is tends to be local. Um, uh, so you're then reading data at the maximum capacity you can. Um, uh, you're using every core on your processors to compute. Um, ideally, if your hardware is reasonably well balanced between uh, spindles and, and cores, um, uh, and you can really get massive throughput um, uh, at, a, at a reasonable cost. Um, it's almost entirely based on sequential access. Um, it directly supports this sorting and merging uh, sort of thing that, that Lucene does, that, that, those style of algorithms. Um, uh, a lot of the, the bookkeeping of doing the sort and merge is, is taken care of for you. Um, and it automates the um, uh, reliability and scaling um, uh, to, uh, to a large degree. Um, failed tasks are retried. Um, uh, if, and, uh, so if, if you can, uh, a job can survive a hardware failure. Um, uh, you even do speculative re-execution if a, um, if a task is running slowly, you can run it again. You can run it simultaneously on another machine um, uh, so, that, so that the overall job time doesn't take a hit just because one thing's running slowly. So since then, since 2006, uh, in the last five years, um, a whole ecosystem of other technologies has grown up around Hadoop. Um, uh, and it's growing all the time. Uh, there are several books out there um, about, about Hadoop. Um, uh, there's commercial support from several companies available. Um, and moreover, there's an expanding network of, of complementary tools, of other, other software packages. Um, so a few of these, um, th this is a graph, you probably can't read it, um, showing dependencies between various modules. Yeah, I can't even read it. Um, uh, and it's, it's amazing the number of different projects that have, that have formed around in the space, um, uh, really, really forming a, a, a pretty thorough stack. Um, so there's Pig and Hive, which you might have heard of. Um, these are higher level query languages, so that people don't have to directly write MapReduce jobs. Uh, they, they generate MapReduce jobs, they, they compile out to MapReduce jobs. Um, uh, they're slightly different style. Pig is an imperative data flow language, um, uh, whereas Hive uses SQL uh, as its query language. Um, uh, another example of an of a ecosystem component is something that I've been working on uh, mostly these days, um, Avro. Avro is an attempt to um, come up with a common data format uh, for all these different interoper interoperating components. Um, uh, I mean, one of the strengths of um, Hadoop is that it, can, uh, it doesn't require a lot of um, thought up front about what your schema is, is going to be. You can just afford to save all your data in whatever form it, it is, uh, whatever it, form it happens in. Um, and, uh, and then later on, worry about um, making it conform to some particular model uh, that your, your application cares about uh, in, in subsequent processing steps. Um, so to some degree, you don't really need a common data format. And Hadoop embraces a, a diversity of formats. 
um, uh, in, in this, this ecosystem. Um, but it's also, if you care about performance, you don't want to always be converting formats. Um, it would be, it's, it's nice if um, one application can read the output of another um, without a lot of work, uh, without having to write new parsers for some new custom format. Um, and that if we're primarily accepting new formats initially in order to, um, we want to save original data, and, and we can generally afford to save original data um, as losslessly as possible. You want, to, you want to save all the aspects of it. Um, and then after that, you can do sort of lossy uh, uh, translations on it um, and uh, do more, more processing. Um, and it makes sense then to have a, a common format. Um, so Avro is a, um, has a schema language uh, a type system. Um, uh, it supports evolution. So uh, people often change their data types um, in, over time um, and, uh, but still want to be able to read old data um, using new programs. And so Avro has a, has a story for that. Um, it um, has an efficient binary encoding, so it, things tend to be small and fast to read. Um, the file format is self-describing. It doesn't rely on having some external description of it. The file is, is a self-contained thing that, that fully describes the data that's in it. Um, uh, it's also an RPC system based on Avro. Um, it's Java, C, C++, Python, Ruby, PHP, now C Sharp as well, um, uh, implementations of Avro. Um, and, and finally, it works with MapReduce. You can um, write MapReduce jobs uh, with Avro as input and output. Um, and we're working slowly to get it spread across the platform so that it can be a, a standard format and, and make interchange easy. I think this will um, uh, decrease a lot of friction between components in the platform if, if people can just naturally um, uh, exchange data sets. Um, another system I think you're going to, you've heard a little bit about this morning uh, and you're going to, I think, hear more about in the coming days about Mahout. Um, it's a machine learning library um, with um, uh, lots of algorithms, uh, including classification, clustering, collaborative filtering. Um, uh, most of these are implemented with MapReduce, not all of them, um, but it's definitely sort of part of the, the family of, uh, of tools that are available. Um, and these are, these are pretty powerful tools uh, for, for understanding your data and, and making use of it. Um, uh, HBase. Um, I think, are there some HBase talks here? I think there are um, this week. Um, uh, it's, as you probably most of you heard of it, but it's inspired by Google's Big Table. Um, it's a, it's a real-time database in, in the way that, you know, Hadoop is all structured towards batch processing. Um, uh, HDFS is um, designed for being able to do, um, or sorry, HBase is designed for being able to do um, inserts uh, and then quickly looking at the results um, uh, so, so not having to wait for, for some big batch, but, but doing real-time inserts and, and uh, accesses. Um, you can do primary key accesses or scan. Um, uh, and it's, um, the scalability and performance are, are pretty amazing. The number of uh, inserts and accesses you can do per second um, uh, is, is phenomenal. It really, it really gets you um, access to that, that commodity, uh, commodity hardware um, uh, performance curve. Um, and again, HBase will work with MapReduce. You can write um, MapReduce job output to HBase. You can um, read inputs from HBase um, as well as uh, from the file system. Um, another example of uh, ecosystem element that's interesting um, is Flume. Uh, Flume's just um, been uh, proposed for the Apache incubator. Um, it's a data collection framework. So uh, it's, it's a way you can... Uh, Put a little bit of software all around your, your cluster that's um, gathering data and feeding it into to, um, HDFS generally uh, with a focus on um, giving you um, uh, reliability and availability so that you, you never are uh, dropping data on the floor. So, it's, uh, so it's a, um, you think of it as a way to collect logs um, or other real-time events um, and, and archive them. Um, so this um, diagram I, I stole from a Flume presentation uh, and it sort of shows an, a common configuration that people uh, are using Flume in, which is a, a neat combination of, of a bunch of uh, components. Um, uh, people will start collecting data and then they'll do a, a fan out 
and they'll archive all the data to HDFS um, directly. Uh, it comes, comes through, flows through like this. Um, uh, and then they can do later, re retrospectively, they can do um, Hive query and Pig queries over the entire data set or portions portion of it um, uh, by date easily. Um, they can also, if they want to have um, more, uh, more real-time access to it, they'll, they'll tee it and they'll send it to HBase as well. Um, and, and they can be doing lookups there. Um, and then at the same time, they might um, take the, very, the most recent data and put it in a Lucene index so they can do uh, certain classes of queries um, uh, immediately. Or maybe they even put it all, all here. Um, uh, and they do all of these. Um, they don't just do, just pick, I mean, you could pick one or the other uh, as, a, as a use of Flume, um, but you could also do all in parallel. Um, uh, and, and in many cases, that's useful. You do want the archival data. Um, you do want some, uh, some, some real-time access to it. Whoa. Uh, here we are. Um, uh, and you also maybe want to do some, some queries of even, even the recent stuff. Um, so this sort of hybrid uh, setup is, is becoming more common. Um, so finally, I want to talk about a, um, a pattern that I've seen uh, for how people adopt these technologies. Um, and uh, I've seen it you know, many, many times. I think Google, I think this is effectively the, the pattern of adoption that initially happened to Google. I know it's the, the pattern that happened at Yahoo. Uh, and I've seen it at lots of other companies since. Um, they initially have some problem where uh, they, they have uh, a data set that they believe has value, but they can't afford, or, or they either can't afford or they can't find no technology which lets them get the access to it that they need. Um, and it's some particular problem. Um, in Google and Yahoo's cases, uh, it was web search, um, that building their, their indexes and, and maintaining these things. Um, uh, they, 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 need, they had this problem. They, they, they needed to be able to have a, a good platform so they could um, uh, evolve their, their technologies as their, as their search products. Um, uh, and so they built, um, you know, Google built its things and Yahoo built, built Hadoop um, primarily for web search. Then once they had it, actually in both cases while they were building it even, um, uh, they started loading in some data sets just so they had some data in there and so people could start doing experiments and they started giving people accounts in the clusters. Um, and people found all kinds of other things uh, that they could do with it. People who, on their own, these applications, these experiments, um, wouldn't have justified the cost of building a cluster or building all this software. Um, uh, but in aggregate, um, they more than, than pay for it. Um, so I mean, Yahoo no longer even does web search and yet it's continuing to grow the number of clusters it has and the amount of data that it's storing um, from all of its other properties. Um, so that there's a one, one application which drives a company um, uh, to invest um, and build a cluster and start using this sort of thing. But then they, they quickly find, oh, we can have these other data sets and we've got these smart guys over in this part of the company who've always wanted to be able to combine these two different data sets but never been able to uh, and, and measure something and, and improve the business. Um, and you, you see this again and again, um, uh, that it's the, um, I think of it a little bit like a, um, uh, a spreadsheet in that you, you know, you used to have to be, in order to get access to the web crawl data at Yahoo or, or Google back in the, in the old days, um, you had to really work on that team. Things were very siloed. If you wanted to, you know, access to the um, uh, advertising data, you had to work on that team. And the two data sets never really came together in a, in a useful way um, because they, both teams were focused on doing what they did um, and it was all they could do to, to make those things happen, to deliver the ad impressions and, you know, and, and all that and to, um, to deliver the web index on time. Um, and uh, by getting it together, then you let other people do, do little thought experiments. Say, what happens if, if we you know, join this with that um, and uh, you know, could, we, could we improve the, the click-through rate for this class of page? Um, and, uh, and it really... Um, snowballed um, into a, a huge thing in the company where everyone was clamoring for access um, and coming up with, with applications. Um, so there's a quote, I think this comes from Facebook, um, uh, where they say, 
they don't, they don't use Hadoop because they have a lot of data. Um, they have a lot of data because they use Hadoop uh, that they can, they can afford to. Um, uh, it's not just being able to afford to, change, to save it. Um, uh, if you can just save it but not do anything with it, then there's no point. Um, but if you have a platform that lets you take advantage of it, um, then you have a reason to start saving it. Um, and, it, and, it and it gives you value, and it gets rid of these silos. Uh, and you, you start, to, start to have all your data in one place um, and, uh, and um, anyway, enable uh, all kinds of wonderful things. Uh, um, so I'm going to summarize here uh, and, then, uh, and then wrap up and, and take some questions. Um, the key advantages that, that I see of the, the family of approaches that I, that I talked about, a um, huge one is, is cost effectiveness. Um, uh, and uh, open source, I think, plays to that as well. Um, uh, but that it, you can scale pretty much linearly on, on commodity hardware, um, and you can do sort of back of the envelope computations. I need, you know, I'm going to collect data at this rate, and I'm going to, you know, collect so many terabytes, and I need to process it at this rate. I need so many CPUs, and it more or less pans out um, uh, that that that's all there is. There aren't any, uh, there aren't there aren't a huge amount of, of hidden bottlenecks. Um, uh, um, it's general purpose. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's pretty easy to program. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly blunt tool, blunt set of tools. Um, they're, they're not doing necessarily very sophisticated things from a, um, a high level. Um, but because it's a simple, blunt tool, people can use it to then build fairly sophisticated processing um, uh, and, and algorithms. Um, uh, and finally, there's, this, there's a low barrier to entry. Um, uh, unlike a, a, a traditional database where you need to um, model your data before you start doing things, um, uh, decide you know, what's your, um, what your tables are going to be and what the fields of these various tables are going to be and what the uniqueness properties are going to be and all those sorts of things, you can just start dumping your data in and writing jobs in Perl or Python or whatever you want. Uh, um, so it, it's a... Um, it's very easy to get going, and then as you start to get going and find value, then you can formalize things more um, uh, as, you, as you find need to do so. Um, so that's all I have. Um, happy to take questions, both about stuff I talked about and anything else. Yes. Uh, there is a microphone here, and I will also repeat the question. But. The question is, do I think the availability of high bandwidth data center, data center networking like InfiniBand is going to change the equation? Um, my suspicion is that, you know, that there'll still be this, you can get a, um, a, a rack top switch with 40 um, ports that's faster than something with 400 ports um, uh, per, the, the port, per port cost um, to get uh, bandwidth. That, 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 that there'll still be a, an economy in, um, and having a little bit of a hierarchical system, um, uh, but that's just my guess. Um, uh, you know, I I don't follow those things, that, those hardware trends that closely. Um, uh, it, it it makes sense to me that a, a giant crossbar is is harder to build than a, a smaller crossbar, um, and and that you'll pay more per per so, per port on it. Um, but that may not end up being true. Um, I don't. Do you have an opinion? <laughs> All I know is that everybody, so the question, his, his answer was that um, he comes from a, a scientific computing, what did you call it, a high performance computing um, uh, HPC um, uh, world where um, they have storage systems with uh, gigabits in and out, gigabytes in and out, um, and uh, that moving data to their compute systems uh, doesn't seem attractive um, or is questionable. Um, what I know is that people who try to do that, try to, try to say run MapReduce jobs using a, share, a shared storage system like that, 
um, end up wishing they hadn't. Um, and uh, that, that the network ends up being, becoming a bottleneck and become, becomes totally overwhelmed. Um, and you know, you'd, you'd have to look at the particulars of some setup uh, and to, to see that. But um, uh, do you really believe in your HPC setup that you can drive every spindle at capacity, reading data as fast as it can, and, and keep every core fed? Um, and if you can, then great. <laughs> uh, and, and you have as many cores as you want. Um, and you have as many spindles as you want. Um, uh, but uh, it's, it's certainly simpler um, if you can have the spindle right next to the core um, and, uh, and just have the data. You're definitely going to have the bandwidth then. It's not, it's not even an issue um, in, in the other case. So. Yeah? Was more than, that was more than one question. <laughs> the first one was, where do I think commercial players will attack? Where, where will commercial players win and where will the new players win? And I'd like to sort of address um, old as well as new commercial players. Because I think that's the question. Okay, where will commercial players win? Um, so I think, and, and old as well as new commercial players. Um, what we're seeing with the old commercial players is um, they want to play along. Uh, they want their stuff to work with this stuff because they see it as a direction people are going and they want to continue to be relevant. Um, they've got solutions that work really well for particular problems. Um, what we tend to see, uh, what, what I hear from people at, at Cloudera um, working with customers, is if you've got a problem that Teradata works well for, there's no reason to try to use Hadoop for it. Um, just you know, stick with Teradata, you're, you're probably doing fine. I mean, it is tremendously expensive. A lot of people are trying to use Teradata, I don't even know that much about what Teradata does, so I'm just using that as a, as a stand-in for, for a lot of these things. Um, uh, that if, um, that a lot of people are trying to use Teradata for things that it doesn't work that well, and it's getting stretched, and it's getting really expensive, um, and so they end up moving to Hadoop. But um, there certainly are you know, commercial tools out there um, uh, that do some things very well that the Hadoop stack doesn't do at all. I mean, you look at you know, you know, Oracle, the classic example, um, you know, doing, having packages for doing payroll. We, we don't want to do payroll in, in Hadoop, <laughs> Not in a, you know, and, and, and various things like that. Um, so um, I think there's a, um, with the old vendors, the old guard, there's a sort of coexistence and uh, is, is, I think, seeming to be the, the thing in the, where they're trying to um, make it seamless for them to interoperate with this new stuff and to find their niches um, that they're already doing well in. Um, whether long term that's sustainable, I, I don't know. Um, New commercial offerings? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, we, uh, I, can, I, mean I could try to explain um, uh, Cloudera's commercial offering. I could try to explain Mappers. Where's Ted? There he is. Um, uh, commercial offerings. Whether either of those are, um, are the right uh, you know, guess uh, commercially for those companies, uh, I, it's too soon to tell. I, I, don't, I don't pretend to know the future. Um, you had some more questions in there, probably. OK. Do, so what's your, what's your thought? That sounds possible. Uh, open source has a big uh, advantage here, I think, um, uh, in that, in that you, you tend to get more people collaborating, uh, and that makes it more expensive to beat. Um, uh, you tend to get more ready adoption. Um, uh, so we'll see. Um, uh, uh, we've certainly seen open source get a, get a, a big head start in this space. Um, whether that's sustainable, 
uh, over the long term? I suspect it is. Um, I suspect we'll see um, uh, some commercial inroads, but they'll tend to be in, in niches, um, and that the, um, the ability of everyone to collaborate on the, op on the open source kernel aspects of things um, uh, will continue to be a, a big advantage, and that if, some, if someone were to get some um, proprietary package which was essential, then someone would clone it. Um, and, you know, unless you think patents are going to stop that, which they could, but... Uh, <laughs> um, Ted. Yeah, I spent some time this last week with Andy Bechtelsheim of Arista and also with some other high-performance uh, networking vendors. And I think that they actually do have offerings that are going to make a big difference to Hadoop over the next year to three years. And we're seeing applications where we can move a gigabyte reasonably between boxes and we're moving very high volumes off the spindles. And so I think that is going to change things, but I think it's going to change things not qualitatively, but in the details. So we're going to see variations. Right now, people say that the standard practice is four to six spindles per box. We may see people go up to 12 to 18 spindles per box uh, and, and just change those ratios. We, we see a lot of 12 to 18 already. Yeah, um, and, and as you begin to be able to drive those more aggressively and as the machine-to-machine -machine, uh, barriers drop a bit, then I think you're going to see some dramatic changes, but only in those ratios in the best practices. And you're going to have slightly different applications that saturate your I.O. And I take issue, I think, with Shevik's imagery there. He says, talks about taking ground and, and who, you know, retreat and attack and smash, things like that. I think that what's going to be successful are companies that work with the community rather than attack the community. I think attack the community is the old style. I think there's going to be companies that try to do that. But I think that there's going to be a whole bunch of companies that embrace the community, become part of it. There's, the, the community grows into an ecosystem instead of just being a community. But they work with it, and then, then everything works well. And then there's going to be a lot of that, a lot of innovation that's proprietary, a lot that's open, and there's going to be room for everybody. It's a growing world, not a shrinking one. Anybody else have questions, observations? Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> I'm. Um, lately, there's been some background noise about the single point of failure problem with uh, HDFS and the, the limitations around there. There's been a couple of commercial companies that have uh, made some closed source offerings and then also a couple of side projects to look at alternatives there. Um, is there a definitive course of action that the Hadoop community itself is looking at to relieve some of these pain points? Uh, they're especially important to uh, companies that are trying to use things like HBase and, and uh, MapReduce in a more real-time fashion where uptime and availability is critical. Um, yeah, there, there definitely has been a commitment um, to try to get, um, I know, for, for example, Cloudera um, has uh, committed to, um, uh, I believe, deliver um, uh, an HA name node um, uh, early uh, 2012 um, in, its next, in its next major release, which is due out uh, early 2012. Uh, there's been a lot of work in the last couple of weeks um, uh, by some folks at Yahoo, Facebook, and Cloudera in collaborating on a proposal for how to implement uh, an, uh, an HA name node. Um, uh, so yeah, there's definitely work going on. There's people committed. I mean, you can't. We can't. Nobody's going to guarantee it. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to say. Uh, pe people have said they want it to happen. People are working on it, um, and people have even given a date by which they want it to happen. Um, uh, so so yeah, um, I think it's oftentimes overstated. Um, uh, there was a nice paper in um, I think it was ACMQ, an interview with one of the guys who worked on GFS. Um, uh, this is like a year or two ago, um, where he sort of walked through the various um, stages of, of GFS. You know, that at first it took, you know, an hour to recover when the name node crashed. Um, it's not about data loss, for those who are concerned. It, you know, it, it's about um, uh, availability. The primary problem is upgrades in most installations. It's not downtime due to crashes. Um, uh, but if you've got a, a system that you need to run 24-7 uh, for some, cons you know, consumer-facing 
uh, service, you can't afford scheduled downtime. So it's, it's scheduled downtime is, is the predominant issue that people have in, in practice, people who, who run these clusters. Um, uh, and, um, and so what they worked on at Google was just not re-architecting things fundamentally so much as decreasing that failover time through various optimizations, you know, make the... Uh, and so there's been a lot of work going on in HFS in that regard, making the um, uh, reading of the... replaying of the log events faster, making the reading of the, um, uh, the whole file system image faster, making the, rep you know, the initial block reports faster, um, and, and, and shrinking that window. Um, and been a lot of progress. I don't, I'm not going to give you a number, but it's, it's getting significantly faster. And Google talked about how they, you know, they go from an hour to 10 minutes to, you know, one minute. And finally, they're down to, you know, it's, maybe it's 10 seconds or 30 seconds. Um, and yeah, it's a hiccup. Yeah, it's a pain. People are going to, you know, uh, now and then when they're doing, uh, you know, I don't know, Gmail or, or something like that, uh, going to see these hiccups. Um, but it's not that long and they're not that often. Um, uh, and so it's bearable. Um, and even in the things that people call HA, there really is still some failover time. Um, it's, not, it's not continuous, um, I, I don't believe. I've never heard anybody tell a story for how you, how you fail over a distributed file system instantaneously. Um, but I mean, not to say there isn't one out there, but um, so it's, it's whittling that down. Um, and there's progress on that that's already committed. Um, uh, 0.22 HGFS uh, and 0.21 HGFS have been steadily improving that, um, and it's going to improve presumably a lot more in the, in the, the, um, the next year um, as we, we get a, a better and better hot spare solution um, and, and spend more time working on the logic of actually doing the failover and making that fast. What uh, happened with Nutch or is happening uh, with Nutch right, right here? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the project's still going along. I think it still does releases. Um, uh, I don't follow it closely. Um, uh, I think it became pretty clear. A couple of things came clear to me. Uh, I mean, I can tell you sort of why I uh, faded away from it. One was that it was never going to really uh, have an opportunity even to reach its potential um, uh, without the, the Hadoop underpinnings being really rock solid. And they weren't going to get rock solid without some serious investment. Um, that a couple of us working part time on, uh, on the distributed file system in MapReduce wasn't going to cut it. That it needed a big team. It was a hard problem. We could get it running on 20 nodes, kind of, sort of. Um, but to get it to run in 1,000 nodes um, uh, needed more work. And so I thought that was a good thing to focus on. Uh, and so I, I sort of went off and focused on that. Um, I mean, there's other problems in that you know, running a, a crawler, um, not only all the hardware resources um, and running a search, um, but there's a lot of manpower just in, involved in um, keeping the quality up. Um, uh, and you know, my hope is that you know you'd get some nonprofit or something to try to run something uh, that was uh, a neutral search engine of some sort that operated completely transparently, um, and never quite figure out how, who was going to do that and how that would work. Um, and uh, and I decided instead to focus on the sort of the engineering underpinnings to try to make it more possible. And it's getting you know, more possible all the time to do that with, with an open source stack. Um, you know, all the things we're talking about would, will, will help in that. Um, Google now uses um, Bigtable for their crawl. Uh, HBase would be very useful uh, writing a crawler. I think Notch is actually getting uh, ported to use HBase um, uh, as for its, for its crawl. Um, uh, so. Um, it's continuing. I mean, it, as I said, it was, it's a very ambitious project. It's not clear it will ever succeed. I think it's still an interesting thing to, to think about what it would take and, uh, and, and, and keep pushing on it. People find a lot of use for it in doing um, sort of vertical specific crawls and intranet crawls. Um, so it's, it's used. Um, uh, but as far as achieving the, the goal of having an open source um, uh, search engine for the entire web, I don't know when that will happen. Uh, my claim at the time when we were starting Nutch was that it was inevitable in the long term um, uh, that, it, that uh, an open source solution would, would um, become as good as the, the non-open source ones. I don't, even, I don't know if they really should call them proprietary because it's just not, it's code that's not published, it's not sold either. Um, uh, and I still, I think, believe that, that, that an open source solution um, in, the, in, the, in the long term um, uh, will, be, will be as good, but I don't know how long the long term is. 
Uh, it could be quite a while yet. Yeah, just a very quick comment on Nudge. Uh, there will actually be a talk tomorrow by myself on Nudge and the latest developments. And I can confirm that, yeah, it's still going. There's still work on it, and uh, we're still very active. So I think I'm officially out of time now. Where's the, where am I? Am I or should I keep going? Take more questions? No, we do have catering set up outside, so I think it's going to be a little hard to keep the people here if, waiti if coffee is waiting outside. I, I don't want to compete with food. It's, One more question. Hi. hi. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I should probably note that I'm not a Google employee first. But uh, <laughs> isn't it a little bit frustrating that everything that comes out from the open source, uh, from you know this this diagram of different projects, is kind of a repetition of what Google of what Google publishes? Like it looks like we're eating breadcrumbs off Google's table a little bit. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I know is what you there, mean. There, do, do you think there is something that the open source community can actually create or invent that the commercial uh, partners will adopt? Like Yahoo adopted MapReduce, but that, again, you know, kind of goes back to Google. Um, I, I think probably other people in here could answer that as well as I could find out, find technology. I think one thing we've seen in the open source world um, is a less um, monolithic, um, uh, design, the, the engineering of all these different components is that they're um, independent, but then they can work together um, largely, um, m much more so than Google. Um, Google uh, has, has, tends to build, uh, which has good and bad sides. Um, I think the, the short-term downside of, of the way the open source um, stack is structured um, is that there's um, there's more costs interacting. You don't know which version of and, and what formats, and there's all these different things, problems to interact with other components. The long-term thing is you allow competitors, you, you will allow evolution um, uh, more easily. Um, uh, and um, so I think, I think in the long term, we've got a, we've got a more robust, um, uh, I guess I call it architecture, that's not quite the right word, uh, structure um, uh, of the, the way these, these different, pro they're, you know, independent projects um, uh, that really do operate independently, um, uh, and you can and getting multiple competing ones. There, I'm sure there's some of that within Google, but I think there's less of that than we see in the open source world. Um, and I also think over time, we'll, you know, the open source world is going to have um, uh, more engineers and more, um, you know, pe research papers and people like that working on it. But you know, it takes time. Uh, Google's, you know, a big company. They've got a lot of people, a lot of smart people working on this stuff. Um, but it doesn't bug me. I mean, it is what it is. They, they, they wrote some papers. It's good stuff. Be useful. Um, we ought to, you know, we ought to implement it. Uh, no, you know, imitation is uh, is flattery. Uh, anyway, um, that's it. Food. <laughs> Thank you.